Welcome to this webinar today. This is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series presented by Firestorm. My name is Bill Baker, and we're pleased to have you with us for this ninth in the 2016 series of webinars. Today, we have Jeff Hamilton, who's uh, going to be discussing the, uh, the natural disasters that can befall us. We'd also like to have you become our friend on Facebook, Firestorm Solutions, and you can follow us on Twitter, Firestorm Soul. There is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We'd like to remind you the presentation is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion, and this work product should be discussed with the, in accordance with advice from your organization's personal counsel. In addition, do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. Firestorm is delighted to have a long-term relationship with our good friends at the College of Continuing Studies at the University of Alabama. As I mentioned, we're talking about wind, water, earth, fire, and natural disasters and how you can best prepare for those natural disasters. You can go to firestorm.com and you can watch past webinars. You can also register for future webinars in this series. We have with us today C. Talantis. She's the program coordinator of the College of Canadian Studies. And what a beautiful picture that is of C. And she's happy because the University of Alabama team really let everybody have a sigh of relief last Saturday against uh, Ole Miss. C, over to you, please. Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody that's joining us today. Um, this uh, this topic ties in nicely with um, with a conference that we would like to, mm -hmm. to highlight. Um, the Human Resources Management Conference, October 13th and 14th, will be held um, in, at the Hyatt Regency in Birmingham, Alabama. And um, again, the topic ties in nicely with this particular conference because it's the HR managers that are typically the people that are going to have to um, handle th uh, situations in a, in a time of crisis. Um, this conference is designed to develop the full range of skills and knowledge, as the slide says, vital to the success of um, HR professionals. And um, in terms of the people that should attend this conference, anybody in the employee and industrial relations, organizational development, benefits and compensation, selection and placement, safety and security, uh, training and development, legal compliance, management practices, or the owner, owner or manager of small businesses. And as far as um, the different topics that are covered, you can you can uh, read the slide as, as well as I can. But um, there's going to be a variety of different um, relevant um, topics to the HR professionals that are will attend. The keynote speakers for the HRM conference are uh, Michelle Adams. She's the vice president of risk management services at Walt Disney. Um, Dave Gray, who is the president and CEO of Dax Daxco, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and Dr. Nick Horney, the founder of Agility Consulting and Training. And please visit our website at training.ua.edu uh, slash HRM for more information. The program manager is actually um, my colleague, Amanda Bergeron. And she, um, her email and contact information are on the slide. Um, please feel free to call or email um, either of us if you have or have questions about the HRM conference in October. And with that, well, we'll turn uh, the presentation back over to Jeff. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, C. Um, College of Continuing Studies does have marvelous presentations with world-class type uh, presenters, we encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities. As I mentioned, today we're talking about national natural disasters and how to cope with them. Our presenter is 
one of our very own people, Jeff Hamilton. He's uh, associated with Firestorm. He's also the president and the chief operating office of Nexus Preparedness Systems. He's located in the San Francisco Bay Area. So off to you, Jeff, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the conference uh, that was just talked about sounds uh, very in-depth and fascinating, and hopefully today's topic will uh, add to some of that knowledge and encourage you to attend the, the conference to gain even more knowledge on a, a very diverse group of topics. And uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm also President and Chief Operating Officer of Nexus Preparedness Systems, and our focus is on effective emergency response. And what I mean by effective emergency response is really taking a look at uh, not only your risk and threats, but aligning them to your emergency response plan, designing a supply resource solution that is integrated fully into that, understanding how to utilize those resources, and training with those resources. So major events that involve wind, water, earth, and fire are often a result of a major regional issue or extended time frames that's really going to cause you to rely on your emergency supply resources. And we're going to talk about the role effective response from that perspective today. And these potential situations are where the local authorities may be overwhelmed. And it will be up to you and your site to protect and sustain your employees, or in the case of educational institutions, take care of your students uh, from that standpoint. And there are different nuances that we'll talk about today between uh, a corporate planning uh, type of approaches as well as a or a school or a university setting. And so what we want to do is look at supplies in a more holistic and analytical approach and making sure those resources are integrated and aligned to the plants and the threats. And really knowing how to utilize those resources and understanding what you have at your disposal will also be very key. So let's look at the analytical side of things. And I talked about effects of emergency response and the need to integrate things because a lot of times what we run across is the supply portion, the resource portion are often thought of in a vacuum. Like, well, I've got an emergency response plan. I've pulled together an emergency response team. Guess I better get some supplies. And so sit down and try to think of a list of what we need. And uh, of course, there's some generic lists on the web that you can get. Um, of course, you're looking at some food, some water, probably some flashlights, maybe a generator. Try to get some stuff for search and rescue. In case, and if anybody's hurt, certainly have plenty of first aid items on hand. And um, we're out here in California. We're an earthquake country. And should those types of events happen, the infrastructure can be compromised, compromised severely. Uh, water systems, sewer systems, power, those types of things. And so you might even need to make provisions for having sanitation, as an example. But you, know, you get this list together, and you're really kind of tasked with, so how much do I really need to get of these things, and what am I forgetting? And even if we're, uh, you know, I mentioned you know we're an earthquake here, we also even need to look at what other threats that uh, may uh, we may have to deal with, uh, depending on the location of the facility. Wildfire can come into place, flooding, um, depending on the nature of uh, your operation. Maybe there's chemical spills. Maybe there's something nearby uh, that, that can affect you. So you really have to think of your supplies in, in, in those aspects. Um, as an example, if, if your plan also includes include search and rescue, do you really have the right supplies to perform the tasks that, that your objectives are really set up for and that your team was trained for. Um, but if you're maybe if you're just simply doing floor warden sweeps and evacuations, um, the scope of the supplies may not need to be a, a, that extensive. And then as your program matures and you may decide to take on a more extensive search and rescue role, then those uh, supplies need to be thought of going forward. And we talk about metrics. Um, we said, yeah, I need food and water for three days. And uh, so what does that really mean? And the only uh, metric out there is really the FEMA says 
uh, talks about water is a half a gallon of water per person per day for consumption. And sometimes they may simply say, for, you need three days of food. So uh, really kind of gets into um, how to utilize metrics to decide uh, the quantities that you need to meet your objectives. And this is actually kind of a, a good illustration and look at you know, a very small aspect of it. And so we say, well, I need some power. And if you look at this and you go out and get a generator and get that five gallon gas can, does it really meet your objectives? So you have to kind of peel these back a little bit and what are you using the power for? What's your real objective? So let's say your objective is you've got three days you're trying to cover, so maybe it's you're figuring you have three periods of eight hours each to cover power during the, the evening time. Um, maybe you're going to power up eight lights. I'll power up a couple laptop computers. So again, getting into kind of the nitty gritty, a 6,000 watt generator uses 1.8 gallons per hour. So if you go back up and look that there's a five gallon gas can, is that going to meet your objective? Uh, in this case, no. Um, a lot of times we even run into uh, the fact that they took the effort to get a gas can but never even fill it up. Um, you're going to power some area lights we talked about. Well, if there are 500 watt halogens, uh, eight of them, well, you're probably okay, but if you have uh, dual headed 1,000 watt units, um, you're going to be undersized. So you got to think about that. Uh, powering laptop computers, as an example. Um, that particular generator is pretty much just a raw power output square wave generator that's going to be fine for lighting. But uh, computers and other delicate equipment of that nature need a very clean power signal like you get out of plugging into a wall. So you may have to consider what's called a, an inverter generator which produces a clean sine wave of power just like you would get out of the wall. Um, how are you going to set up your area that you're trying to power up? Um, if you have a sanitation area and your incident command and your first aid and triage, they all well, that should probably need to be separated, especially the sanitation area. And do you have even the right kind of extension cords based on the power draw? Do you have the right length? Do you have the right gate, depending on what you're power powering? So those are the, the, the nuances when you start looking at each of your line items that you think you're going to get. And so you really need to go back and look at all those line items. So what are the usage rates? And something as simple as batteries. Well, how long do a pair of batteries last? Uh, if you have to set up a sanitation area, look at sanitation chemicals. How many people are you trying to cover and for how long? And we're going to talk about coverage a little later in the presentation. Are there specialized uh, items that people need? We talked about search and rescue items, first aid and triage. How are they using those items? Um, in a first aid and triage area, for example, you may not want to give them just a flashlight, uh, although that could be valuable depending on the nature of what they're doing. But a, a headlamp, for example, is far more useful because they need the use of their hands. So how are they utilizing, utilizing these various items? Talked about. Uh, FEMA only giving the one metric out there uh, is half a gallon of water per person per day. Uh, and that we like to utilize the metric basal metabolic rate. And you can look that up in the web. There's a little uh, calculation you can do that takes into account a variety of factors for people. And bottom line is that says people typically need about 100 calories a day uh, to sustain them. Nobody's going to starve to death in two or three days, but again, you want to make they don't want to create additional situations by not having uh, the right caloric needs. Do you have any unique needs for your particular site? As an example, one of our uh, customers has is a very large site, and they have a daycare center. And that daycare center has infants and toddlers, and there are 600 infants and toddlers. It looks like a, a small high school, um, but when you think that if your emergency supply cache is based on food, bars, and water, that actually creates a dangerous situation for an infant. Infants need to get all their hydration uh, from formula. And if they're doing it, you can't give them water because it really uh, has a severe effect on their electrolyte balance. It creates a very dangerous situation. Um, 
we even discussed this with a, a major hospital out here. They had their pediatric emergency uh, unit, and they said, you know, they saw that we had listed uh, dry formula on our list. They said, you got to be careful. If somebody decides to dilute things beyond the recommended things, uh, thinking that they're going to extend out their uh, capability that creates almost an equally dangerous situation. So you really have to think about, you know, who are your clients essentially? Who are the employees and the students and staff that you're really trying to take care of? And are there any unique needs? And think about it from that standpoint. And then look at, you know, how much room is this going to take up? And uh, actually, it's really not too bad even for three days covering, uh, um, you know, a decent-sized company. Uh, our campus uh, about the room that, that's needed for this. Um, but I encourage you to take all your lists, um, think about the risk, and even spreadsheet it. And we've even gone and developed a tool from our point of view that includes a lot of best practices and metrics and views of things to think about. And we'll even determine um, the amount of space that these types of items take up. So I would encourage uh, you to, to really take it to that. Once you get your resources together, they have to be usable. And we've kind of seen it all. And this is probably one of the more, uh, this particular site um, went and got stuff. Um, they did take the extra effort to use a Sharpie and label some of the boxes there. But um, this is not very usable. Um, during an event, uh, imagine trying to utilize resources and be very difficult to know what things are. Uh, even in this picture, uh, while it's much better in terms of at least uh, kind of an organization or, or accessibility, um, it's all in non-descript difficult to tell where things are or even if they're grouped accordingly. It's very visually confusing and it can be difficult to access. And what are the most important things you need to get at first? What are the things that you need to get at second in terms of priorities? So really need to look at things as one giant kit, if you will, uh, in your supply cache. You be very, um, think of it as uh, how usable the items are, even to the point of doing maps and labeling so that uh, People know where things are, and in the heat of the moment, um, if you can get in there, get what you need, depending on your respective responsibilities and duties, and uh, really take care of business. Um, even something as simple as color coding uh, can go a long way. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, during a, an event, you may have a lot of what I call untrained volunteers. You may have to press some people into service depending on the scope and nature of the event and, and how bad it really is. Um, and as an example, let's say you're, you're running an event and you tell somebody, you take all the first aid and triage items and take them over to that area over there. You may get a deer in the headlight look and somebody says, what does triage mean? And what what are the items related to triage? And instead of taking the time to explain it there and you had done some color coding, the, your response uh, to begin with, may, or your tasks or assignment to begin with may have been more of taking everything with a red label on it and take it over there. Very quick, very simple. Um, people can be valuable in that aspect even though they're not familiar with your supply cache and, and, and what things are but you just may group things functionally because you are going to have to set up areas. Being able to roll something out to say, set up a sanitation area, um, all the things related to first aid and triage, your incident commands, um, those functional groups uh, make it very easy and then you don't have everybody on top of everybody trying to get at their respective supplies. And so you can, uh, you know, set up your working areas uh, very easily from that standpoint. I'll talk about a little bit about allocation. Because sometimes uh, there are items that are very common to all the different groups. Um, you know, things like vests, hard hats, gloves, flashlights. 
Um, they're all important tools at each of the respective groups, but it's important to understand who gets what. And so what if you had a very enthusiastic search and rescue team, and of course very well intentioned, they go in there and say they grab all the flashlights uh, to take care of business. It's starting to get dark and I think they're going to need flashlights. Well, you've now impacted, you know, that group by their actions have now impacted possibly the incident command and area for state and triage areas, for example, because they're now without lighting. And so understanding at least going into it, what the anticipated uh, basis was for buying those, those and who should get what during an event goes a long way. Um, things can change during an event, and certainly maybe there's a very good reason uh, why that search and rescue team may need more than what you'd originally thought in there uh, for flashlights, as in our example. And so by knowing at least the anticipated allocation up front, the person in charge can make appropriate adjustments to try to help that search and rescue team out and not impact the operations of uh, incident command and uh, first aid and triage as an example. So understanding based on assigned needs uh, and, and everybody understanding those assumptions, and again, that goes a, a, a long way. Have that in your plan, and again, it's easier to adjust once all that basis was known and why you decided those allocations were you know, what they were, and be able to uh, judge accordingly and, and make uh, key dis, uh, decisions from that standpoint. And let's talk about uh, uh, something very similar, distribution and deployment of those supplies. So let's say everybody's been taking good notes and listening to what I've been talking about with metrics and things like that. And now it's time to hand out employee supplies, or in the case of uh, educational institutions. And so you really need to uh, think about how you're going to get those items to those people very quickly. And so you really have to think about how is that operation going to happen. And for each item you need to distribute, you probably need about three people. You've got one person handing something out. You've got another person taking things from the pallet to that distribution table. Maybe even a third person that's breaking down boxes and climbing over pallets to get the baskets for one item. So think about uh, Again, you know, our reference point on here is earthquake. We're going to want to have people get food, water, emergency blankets, maybe ponchos, maybe a dust mask, maybe a light stick. So for each of the, those operations, figure about three people. So all of a sudden, it becomes a very large cafeteria-like operation. And uh, it has a very high labor requirement. It's difficult to control people getting back in lines. Um, if you think about schools. Uh, where you have uh, you know younger students, um, that's going to make a very confusing situation for them. What do they need to get? Do they need to get in that line? Do they need to get them? What am I getting? So again, it, it's a very confusing situation. And the people that are out there taking care of business with search and rescue and kind of running the operation, they may not be able to get away at the time you're distributing the supplies. And so. You know, essentially, you basically have to keep this very large and cumbersome operation going throughout the day, and uh, it could be very difficult. So really, we encourage you to put things in a, a kit form wherever possible. So in this example, very simple. It's an 8 by 8 by 6 inch box. Um, there's your half a gallon of water. There's a 2400 calorie food bar. There's a dust mask, there's an emergency blanket, and poncho, and a light stick, and maybe a, a signal whistle. Um, that is something that can ha two, just those two or three people can hand out an awful lot of those items pretty quick. And so what you've got now is you've gone to a single point of distribution. It's much easier to control. Um, the resource now, uh, you know, the student or the uh, uh, employee now has ownership of that resource. 
if they decide that they need to make their way home and can make their way home, they at least have everything with, that they need to be able to carry easily for that journey home. And we'll talk about the coverage and putting people at risk for journey home uh, in the coverage section coming up. Everything uh, they need for 24 hours. And it minimizes the number of distributions that you have to do. And then if you're people that are still stuck there in an extended situation on day two and day three, much easier to deal with the bulk supply um, for, for those days when there are fewer people and uh, things are less less chaotic from that standpoint. And you can make uh, judgments on um, how much you can or cannot distribute the second and third day depending on uh, how good you were at adjusting for uh, people that needed to stick around. Uh, there's another uh, item very similar in nature is deployment of those resources. Let's talk about, as an example, search and rescue folks. So even though you know, we've seen a lot of supply caches where things are very neatly labeled, there's a lot of a la carte supplies, there's a shelf of hard hats, there's a shelf of gloves, there's a shelf of tools and flashlights, et cetera. Um, but in that situation, when done that way, that person who has the responsibility for such search and rescue in this case literally has to go shopping for what they need. So you're creating a certain amount of uncertainty in that aspect. So you're going in, um, they're trying to think about what do I need, what do I think I need, um, and what am I forgetting? The focus really needs to be on what's the rescue situation I need to take care of. Now multiply that by several members of that team going in, trying to get what they need, trying to, again, shop for what they need, and the discussions going on of, what am I forgetting? Are you taking this? Am I taking that? It just slows down the operation. It, sl it slows down the effective response. And if you look at that picture there, those that uh, fireman backs in his hand is probably going to end up on his toe in about two minutes because uh, and it's very difficult for him to, to deal with. So again, whatever you can, uh, and it makes sense, put things in a kit form. It's very similar to what we talked about with employees, uh, the employee kits, and having um, the things that you need that are robust for a wide variety of situations goes a long way. It's easy to transport. It allows for very rapid deployment. Instead of going in and shopping for those items like we talked about, they're grabbing what they need. They're going in, and uh, now they're focused on that rescue situation. And they're going out and taking care of business. And uh, better yet, even if you have these items uh, distributed around your, your site or your, your business campus, your college campus, or your school campus, um, to get those items quickly to those, uh, it, it again, uh, adds to the efficiency of what you're trying to do. Now, let's talk about coverage. Um, this gets very interesting. Um, and because certainly the amount of people you're trying to cover sort of, uh, drives your supply uh, decisions, your resource decisions, um, what criteria are you going to use? Uh, is it a historical reference point? Is it a guess? Is it, based, is it based on budget? Sometimes maybe it's a combination of those things. And in talking about um, an historical reference point, and I like to use the example we have around here. In 1984, we have the Loma Prairie. If you were in the area, you were familiar with what went on, but certainly the nation saw what went on because there was a lot of things with the news. And you saw we had our Bay Bridge, a portion of it collapsed. There was a freeway collapse, um, and um, there were fires in a certain part of San Francisco. And but by and large, uh, people were able to get home. There weren't um, major freeways that that had that issues and things like that. It took a lot longer. Certainly, uh, my commute was normally 40 minutes and took me about three and a half hours. But a lot of people got home and were able uh, to get home. Um, 
but that actually wasn't a Bay Area uh, earthquake centered uh, proper uh, to our area. It was actually in the in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and what you saw were more of soil conditions in the Bay Area that contributed to the uh, particular destruction that you saw in the news. But again, um, people often use that as a reference point, so they may say, well, most everybody left, so I'm going to have supplies for 10% of our people, as an example. Um, maybe they're wanting to put a fudge factor, and they say, I'm going to cover a third of the people. And really, it boils down to a couple things. What if the situation was worse than you had anticipated? And let's say it happened <coughs> Excuse me. later in the day, it was getting dark, where there was um, going on, and instead of the, a third that you would anticipate, most everybody stuck around till the morning. Well, now the supplies for those one third you're trying to cover for three days now gets consumed in 24 hours. And uh, people that are truly stuck there for multiple days uh, are without. Um, likewise, if you look at that, that picture, um, and let's say it did go true to form, and a third of the people had to stick around and two-thirds left. Those two-thirds of the people are going from a uh, point of refuge where there are supplies and they know what the uh, conditions are around that area, and trying to head home, even if it's a mile hike or a ten-mile hike, et cetera. Um, and they thing without food, water, and emergency blanket. Now they're at risk. So you have to kind of think about what your objectives are for the particular uh, your particular site. So what we like to propose, um, and it really from a monetary standpoint, isn't the, the cost uh, that much more, um, is do a 100% coverage, and then use an attrition rate model for day two and day three, and it increases the flexibility dramatic, um, covering everybody for the first 24 hours um, really gets you out of the, the issue of who's going to be put at risk by leaving. Um, and then again, for the variety of situations that you may encounter, whether people stick around or not, um, they now have things to be able to take home. The people that uh, do stick around your site have, are taken care of for the next 24 hours, and again, from our previous example, the distribution was very easy. At day two and day three, and make some of your estimates. Maybe it's something as simple as saying, I'm going to assume half the people are going to be gone day two and another half day three. Um, maybe you want to get a little more scientific about it and actually look at employee commute distance as an example um, and figure how many people live within 10 miles as an example and make some uh, adjustments on that. We actually had uh, one client whose headquarters was uh, in a certain area and had a very typical uh, setup where about uh, uh, 25 to 35 percent lived within 10 miles. Well, they had moved their headquarters uh, to the next town over about 20 miles away. Well, their longtime employees didn't move their homes. And so their uh, uh, employees that lived within 10 miles is actually closer to 8%. And so they really had to look at their day two and day three assumptions in a little more detail and have a lot more of a robust uh, supply solution just because of that particular. Um, and then, again, certainly, since you covered everybody at least for 24 hours, um, and hopefully things will stabilize uh, day two and day three a little more. You can make some decisions uh, under less uh, uh, you know, chaotic situation. Um, if if you uh, was worse than you thought day two, you can at least adjust some of your distribution uh, ideas. And if it was better, then you know that you're in good shape. Now let's take a look at practicing with those resources. And uh, things get purchased, and nobody knows what the original idea was uh, about those supplies, and what was the basis for the supplies, and what's in the supply cache. It's kind of the common joke of who's got the key. 
and um, being familiar with how to use some of those supplies. And as an example, um, I've camped all my life and I've set up so the easy of canopies and it's very straightforward and I even know how to do it, do it when it's pretty windy. Um, but if you've never done it, it may be confusing. And you don't want to figure these things out in the heat of, of, of a major event going on. And so people really don't get trained to the plan that incorporate other resources. Sometimes those resources aren't even acknowledged in the plan. There's a limited awareness of what's in the supply cache and what was the uh, original idea. And supplies may not be aligned to the operational response. And that gets into more of the items such as uh, the scope of search and rescue an example. Do they have the right supplies to accomplish uh, what they were trained for and what the objectives are for that particular team? I'm going to go through a great example. And this is. Uh, a particular company that really I always kind of put them as kind of the gold standard and they, they do a lot of um, exercise with their supplies and they've gone through and they understand the metrics and they understand their threats and they've aligned their supplies so he said they've done everything very well and during one of their exercises um, what they decided to do is go through their entire list of supplies and do a little bit of reorganizing so it worked a little more efficiently uh, for their methods of, of deployment. And really what they kind of came uh, to the realization of was that uh, there were some very interesting groupings that happened. Um, the first one was that there were certain things that were organizational in nature. They were the, you know, the, the things for incident command, some hard hats, some vests, uh, building plans, headcount checklists, some lighting, those types of things. Those are all the things that allowed them to get things going. They call it their open for business items. Um, there were things that were situational in nature. Depending on the nature of the event um, would be what got deployed. So a simple medical emergency, then uh, I'm just going to get into some of the first aid and triage supplies. Uh, it was more of a major event like, again, we tend to plan for out here like an earthquake. You can start pulling the trigger on a wide variety of things. You're going to pull out the search and rescue items and things like that, in addition to things like first aid, um, maybe even a lot more tools and search and rescue tools and resources around your site. Um, and then the last were more situational and time bound. And that's kind of where you come to the realization like, this is going to be more than just a few hours of dealing with the response. We're going to be here for several days. Um, our place is going to become kind of a bed and breakfast from that standpoint. So then you get into things like day two and day three uh, uh, food, setting up sanitation areas, um, those types of things. And so what they really came out with is that they exercised with their supplies. knew how to use them. They knew how to use them in the context. And the teams are oriented to the supplies. And one of the stories that really came out of it is the best illustration that I can say is they've realized that uh, they had a lot of petite people on their search and rescue team. And so the hard hats were falling off. They had standard size leather palm work gloves, and they could hardly even use them because they were just too bulky to deal with. And so they realized that during their uh, post-event uh, hot wash, that the improvement to the program was to, again, get fitted hard hats and have some size gloves uh, put in their supply cast. But only because they exercised with those supplies that that came out. If you look at things uh, from the standpoint of, hey, they've got the right list, everything is, is you know, ideal, um, only by exercising with those supplies that they realized that they had a flaw in um, in their uh, supply resource uh, design. And, uh, and again, sound very simple, but you want to be able to be efficient. So having uh, a hard hat that's not going to fall off and gloves that can actually do your task with is a key item. We've gone through a lot of topics today. We talked about the need to really look at each item that's on your list, make sure it's aligned to your, your uh, risks and threats, 
and understand how it's used in the metrics that are needed for it, whether it's calories, um, fuel usage, those types of things. Once you get everything to, together, it has to be usable. Treat your large uh, supply cache as a giant kit. Understand the allocation of those items and think about how those items need to get deployed the most efficient and effective way uh, for what you're trying to do. Coverage becomes a very key item, and, and I think one of the things I kind of skipped over in the coverage, especially with the things like a school or a university. In the case of, a, let's say, a grade school, you don't have to think about so much where the kids come from. You have to think about where their parents commute in from work, because that will determine possibly some assumptions on how many people, kids you're going to have to cover for a certain length, length of time, uh, for parents being able to get from work to pick up their kids because of a custodial situation. In the case of a university, it becomes important because maybe there's a certain amount of students, there's a commuter type of situation, and there's a certain amount of, of students where they live on campus or near campus in a dorm. And so um, that is their home. So they're not going to go anywhere, and they need to have full coverage for some period of time, depending on the nature of the risks and threats that you have in your area. And then finally, um, talk about exercising with supplies. If you don't do anything else um, from the above items, exercising with your supplies will bring out a lot of the, the weak points in your plan, and you can adjust accordingly. And it's really going to take you back to look at things um, in a very detailed point of view and peeling back that onion with certain things. So with, from a fire start perspective, we like to put things in a predict plan and perform type of approach. So making sure that you've identified your, th your threat and aligned those threats to your emergency response plan. Designing your supply solution based on that plan, based on those uh, particular risks and threats, and how you're going to deploy those items. And really, again, emphasize this enough, it's training with your supplies and revising it based on what worked and what didn't work. And uh, again, with the goal of having an effective and uh, very efficient emergency response because time really matters and uh, you're talking about um, people that can be injured or your, your, your site being uh, at risk. So the more effective you are, the less consequences there are from that. Uh, this information is available for download. You go to firestorm.com briefs. And there's a summary of a lot of the key topics we talked about uh, from that standpoint. And uh, again, just to uh, remind folks that uh, there's a great uh, training session coming up from the University of Alabama. And there's the contact information. And I can be reached at jhamilton at firestorm.com. Um, Bill, any closing words? For or folks from the University of Alabama. C, do you have any comments? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jeff, for um, presenting on such a timely topic. Um, with the recent floods and uh, other natural disasters fresh in our memories, it's important really now more than ever to be prepared with a good plan in place um, should the unforeseen happen. Um, here in Tuscaloosa a few years ago, we had a uh, uh, a sudden snow and ice storm, and, and you mentioned kids in schools. Um, some kids had to spend that with their teachers in the school because their parents literally couldn't go pick them up. So um, that's something that happened right here in Tuscaloosa. Um, and, uh, and again, just a, a quick reminder about the Human Resources Management Conference, um, October 13th and 14th. Um, in, at the Hyatt Regency in Birmingham, it's that's the, actually the, the old Winfrey Hotel. And if anybody has any questions uh, or would like more information about that training, uh, that conference, uh, please contact us anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you, C. And thank you, Jeff, for an excellent presentation. Uh, do feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And uh, Jeff Hamilton would be delighted to tell you more about this. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. And we'll talk. look forward to hearing you from you next week. Excuse me, next month. Okay, thank you.